Hello, I'm Larry Levitt from KFS. Welcome to the latest episode of the Health Wonk Shop. About once a month, we delve into timely and complex health policy topics with experts from a, from a variety of perspectives. Today, we're looking at the healthcare workforce, focusing in particular on nurses and allied health professionals. Notwithstanding recent reports of an AI-powered automated diagnostic pod, healthcare is, at least for now, primarily a labor-intensive service. For patients to access care, we need the right healthcare workers in the right place available to provide it. Historically, the healthcare workforce has been fairly recession-proof, but that wasn't entirely true in this last pandemic-fueled downturn. And while healthcare employment has largely recovered, that's not the case for all segments of the healthcare workforce or in all parts of the country. There are clear signs of stress within the healthcare workforce with shortages, strikes, and burnout. Today, we're joined by a smart panel of experts to dissect what's happening and what's behind it. Gretchen Berlin is a senior partner at McKinsey and a registered nurse by background. Bianca Frogner is a health economist, director of the University of Washington's Center for Health Workforce Studies and professor in the Department of Family Medicine. And Alice Burns, is associate director of KFS program on Medicaid and the uninsured. If you have questions, submit them at any time through the Q&A button in Zoom and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Also note that this session is being recorded and an archived version should be available later today. Bianca, let's start with you uh, with a pretty basic question. Uh, do we have a shortage of healthcare workers uh, or is that even the right question to ask? Well, thank you so much for having me here today, Larry, and for having this conversation. Um, so, as my uh, good friend Aaron Freyer at UNC would say, asking the question of do we have a health workforce shortage is just a starting point in a conversation. And I'm glad that this is where we're starting today. Uh, you know, it's not a simple yes or no answer. I think generally there is a broad perception among employers that we have a shortage, um, but we really have to ask where, for whom, for what purpose are we having a health workforce shortage? I think we certainly feel a lot of stress in the primary care space. I think we're feeling a lot of stress in the behavioral health space, um, as well as the long-term care space. So we have many sectors of the healthcare industry that are certainly feeling a crunch of trying to find workers to fill the slots, as well as then we have like a maldistribution problem of different areas of the country also struggling to find workers to fill the slots that they need, particularly in rural areas and underserved communities. So I would say it is a good question to ask of whether or not we have a shortage or not, but it's not a simple yes or no question. And what, uh, this is a complicated question, which we'll come back to, but, um, you know, what's behind it? I mean, you know, in, in most parts of the economy, uh, you know, there you reach kind of an equilibrium, right? That pay rises, attracts more people to the profession. What, what's going on here? Well, I certainly think we're still struggling with the aftermath of COVID or maybe aftermath isn't even the right comment to say. I mean, where we are with COVID, it, we're in a new world relative to where we were a few years ago, where um, there's a combination of just the kind of lingering effects of kind of bad feelings among healthcare workers, where initially they were kind of promoted as heroes. And then as time has gone on, they're feeling a lot of um, uh, workplace violence really take uh, take a hit. They're really feeling that in their workplace right now. And so as a result, our workers are feeling tired and burned out and, and they're saying, you know, I've had enough. So that's kind of coming from COVID, but that certainly was fueled a little bit before COVID. Uh, you add to that, that many of our uh, workers are facing low wages. And as the economy, you know, recovers in this post pandemic period, uh, they are seeing other job opportunities. And so that's where the economy starts to put some pressure on our employers as they're competing for workers across sectors. Um, and then, you know, there's a new generation of people entering the workforce every day, and they have different preferences for their work environment. And we are seeing that in the broader economy that people are saying, you know, I don't want to work for these long hours where I'm poorly um, valued. So I, I deserve better. So uh, Gretchen, let me turn to you. Uh, Bianca mentioned uh, kind of bad feelings among healthcare workers. Uh, you've done quite a bit of work on the current state of mind of nurses in particular. Um, how are nurses fa faring? How are their attitudes towards their profession, their employers, their workload, uh, healthcare in general uh, changed over time? Yeah, thanks so much uh, for the question, Larry, and, and for having me here with uh, Bianca and Alice. Um, as you mentioned, we have 
been looking at nursing sentiment really since the start of the pandemic. And um, I think, unfortunately, some scary things have remained constant. I remember when we got the first survey back about, you know, 25 or 30 percent of nurses saying that they were planning to leave was pretty shocking. But then to see it consistently still happening, um, although on one hand we've gotten used to it, it's very alarming how consistent it has been. And frankly, we continue to see that today with about 30% saying they want to leave. Um, we published a, a study last week with the American Nurses Foundation, really looking at the sort of mental distress of nurses. And unfortunately, um, over 55% of nurses reported experiencing symptoms of burnout. Um, now, that's not all of the reason why folks are leaving, but that is... An, an unacceptable state for, frankly, I think what all of society, all of us through a variety of factors have, have put on them. And so it's not surprising that we continue to see folks saying that they uh, plan to leave. And, you know, I, I agree with Bianca's answer. The shortage question is not simple today, but we project that, uh, you know, these trends will continue to lead to a shortage um, you know, we could be short up to 20% of what we need by 2025. The other thing I would say is, um, while we haven't done as much research uh, in other countries, when we have, this is a global issue. So I think a lot of times people ask the question around, you know, immigration policies and can't we just get from other locations? But the reality is a lot of the same things we're seeing in the U.S. are being experienced in um, certainly developed countries around the world. And at the end of the day, what we're seeing folks say they want is a safe work environment, some work-life balance, uh, a workload that they feel they can successfully deliver on uh, on a daily basis. And that's been consistent across time as well as across geographies. Yeah, and as Bianca said, those are those are things everyone's looking for, not, not <laughs> simply nurses. Um, yeah. Let me tease out a little bit. When you talk about Kind of intent to leave um is that leave their current employer leave the nursing profession in general or leave patient care into uh yeah. you know, non-patient uh, facing positions it's a mix of both so the the number of folks who say they plan to leave their current role has gone up to 40 or 45 percent and then those that plan to leave um either direct patient care or nursing altogether because obviously there's forms of nursing where you're not providing patient service tend to be lower but still pretty high um around 20 to 30 percent and while turnover in the industry has come down a bit since the height of covid it's still hovering around 22%, which is, you know, depending on the cut you look at, three to 6% higher than it was before COVID. So still at pretty unsustainable uh, levels. Um, Alice, let me turn to you. Uh, you know, Bianca mentioned uh, the long-term care, long-term services and support workforce in, in particular. And that, that's a part of the healthcare workforce that is not recovered uh, from, from the recession. Uh, you know, what are some of the unique factors behind shortages in, in that sector? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first, the COVID pandemic disproportionately affected the long-term care workforce. And in the early years of the pandemic, a fifth of all deaths were occurring in nursing facilities. And stat and employment levels in those facilities are still 10% below their pre-pandemic levels. So that's one piece of it. Another piece is the workforce is a little different. And we're talking about a broad range of paid and unpaid services that range from changing someone's catheter, giving them an IV, giving them a shower, preparing their dinner. And that's a really different skill set. Another thing is the payer mix. Medicare and private health insurance generally don't pay for long-term care. So over half of the expenses are covered by Medicaid. And over 25%, people are paying out of their own pocket. And that really places this downward pressure on payment rates, which then puts downward pressure on wages. So most of these workers are making $15 an hour. What they could make at, say, Target, or Starbucks with you know, much less physically and mentally demanding jobs. And you know, Gretchen talked about the immigration. Um, LTS's jobs are disproportionately filled by foreign-born workers. And 
the green uh, the green cards are per currently frozen, so nobody who has applied since June 2022 will be considered for a green card, and that is adding additional tension to this situation. So uh, we've been talking a lot about these these kind of shortages or potential shortages in workers. Uh, kind of on the other flip side, uh, the Biden administration has recently proposed uh, new staffing standards in, in nursing facilities that would uh, increase, potentially increase the number of uh, workers required in, in those facilities. Um, describe briefly kind of what, what the Biden administration has proposed, where we kind of stand in that process, uh, and, and what the effects of that proposal would be if it were finalized. Yeah, sure. So that proposal came out in September. And it would stop, it would require nursing facilities to have a nurse um, present 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it would create minimum requirements for the number of registered nurses and the nurse aides. And this is to re reflect longstanding concerns about the quality and sufficiency of staffing in nursing homes. Uh, low staffing was cited as one of the reasons for all of those COVID deaths in the facilities. Uh, the big thing is the rule would not be implemented for a number of years. Facilities would have three to five years to come into compliance. There would be broad hardship exemptions, and it's unknown how many facilities would qualify. Uh, we did look at how many facilities could meet the requirements with their current staffing levels, and fewer than one in five would currently meet them. Again, that's not accounting for the hardship exemptions or the time they have to comply. The other really important piece of the nursing facility situation is ownership. And so when we looked at this by ownership, we found that only 10% of the for-profit facilities have enough staff to meet these requirements. 40%, um, I mean, much closer to half of the nonprofit and government facilities do. So, um, <laughs> I mean, we've talked about this kind of potential shortage of workers, now a requirement for m more staffing. Um, uh, and as you said, you might, nursing facilities might need to pay more uh, to certainly have more staff and to attract uh, more staff. Uh, you know, where would the money come from to, to pay for that? So, th so that, is, that is the question, right? Because there are also requirements in the home and community-based long-term care sector that would require states to potentially pay more for Medicaid services uh, for people who live in the community. And a lot of the workers are the same people. And so if we just shift them from one sector to another, we're not really addressing the underlying problem. And when we get to the underlying problem, we can look at what states are doing. And so states have been taking all sorts of innovative strategies um, with some of the extra flexibility and funding they had during the pandemic. And what they found is increasing payment rates, definitely part of it, but also establishing career ladders, helping people have opportunities for advancement, you know, seeing these, making these jobs a place people want to be. So, um, Alice, you, I mean, you talked about sort of some of this being fungible, right? Workers can work in one sector uh, or, or another. People can obviously move from one part of uh, the country to another. Uh, you know, during the pandemic, we saw this growth in traveling uh, nurses uh, with, you know, in some cases, much, much higher pay. Um, Bianca, talk a little bit about sort of what, I mean, how this market works, right? I mean, how, how where, where are we seeing more severe shortages in certain parts of the country in certain uh, sectors like behavioral health? Um, yeah, thank you, Larry, and thank you for that summary, Alice, of kind of what's what the state of the world is looking like in the long, in, especially in skilled nursing facilities with these staffing requirements. And I would say, you know, hospitals certainly have played around also with the idea of having uh, staff ratios, staff to patient ratios, and this is all with the eye towards quality. But and they are good for patients to have, you know, the proper number of staff for per patient to make sure that patients are getting high quality care. But the problem is, where's the supply of workers when you put those uh, ratios into play? And Larry, as you suggested, people are moving around all the time in the healthcare industry and then across industries. There's a lot of dynamic between the hospital sector and the and skilled nursing facilities, where we certainly have seen in research that I've done that with others that uh, people are constantly moving actually between skilled nursing facilities and hospitals. Uh, and I would say to some degree, um, 
hospitals and nursing homes have already had a long you know, history of working together in the sense that uh, hospitals are trying to discharge patients into skilled nursing facilities. And then when staffing is low and uh, insufficient in nursing homes, they cannot take on the patient load that maybe they could have before or if they had higher levels of staff. So hospitals are finding themselves having to figure out how to staff their um, hospitals so that they can take on the increasing patient load or the long patient load that as patients are sitting there in hospitals, not unable to be discharged. Um, but within within the long-term care uh, arena, as Alice kind of pointed out, there's uh, a move to move people into the home and community-based service um, sector because there's this uh, hope and desire by people that they want to age in place. And so we need more home health workers also, but people are certainly moving between these jobs. Um, so again, we're kind of seeing people move in and out of these fairly, um, I would say jobs that have low barriers to entry, like these nursing assistant jobs, home health aid jobs, personal care aid jobs, where they have uh, minimal training requirements to get into these jobs. And then once they're in there, they're, these workers, you know, understandably are looking around and asking, okay, which job gives me the best benefits beyond wages, like health insurance, um, having, you know, enough money to pay for their transportation to work, for example, do their laundry for their scrubs, et cetera. Um, and then they're looking around to see, well, are there jobs that are a little bit easier and just as fulfilling in other sectors? So again, we, we're, we're struggling with this competition between sectors. But Larry, you mentioned travelers, you know, travelers was an interesting kind of byproduct of the COVID uh, pandemic where, I mean, anytime we've seen a crisis around the country, we see travelers emerge to help fill in gaps uh, whenever there's an emergency somewhere in the country. Uh, what was unique about this particular pandemic is that everybody was in an emergency situation kind of simultaneously. It certainly started in urban areas first, and then it started to roll out into rural areas and so as a result, everyone was competing for the same pool of workers. And then as uh, I think Alice uh, and maybe Gretchen also pointed out, immigration uh, had stalled. And so we couldn't pull, pull from a pool of workers internationally to fill our gaps because everywhere else in the, uh, in the world, they were also struggling at the same time. So the pool just got limited. Uh, and, and then on top of that, workers themselves were getting sick and were having to make difficult decisions about whether or not to go to work or not, uh, whether or not to care for their families or not. And some just didn't have a choice. Schools closed, caregivers disappeared for children. And healthcare is a very female dominated field. And so women just had to make incredibly difficult de decisions, not only women, but certainly more so that burden fell on women than, than men. I think if I can, Larry, just building on yeah, the point about the competition kind of between industries, I think there's even growing competition within healthcare as we see increasing shift of care into ambulatory settings, the players that in the ambulatory settings that are popping up where you can get healthcare all require clinical staff. And so there is, you know, greater competition for talent in various places. And with that comes greater agency for clinicians too, which to a certain extent is great. But, you know, back to Bianca's opening comments of the shortage is not equal in every location. I think where we see it, unfortunately, most, uh, dire, I guess, is in traditional med surge bedside nursing. And um, to some of Bianca's comments as well, health systems are innovating. You know, it's not as though they're just sitting there bemoaning the problem. And, you know, we're seeing a lot of flexibility on schedules to try and provide more flexibility, increasing in childcare, as Bianca was saying, recognizing the gender and other, you know, family commitments that are out there. Um, the other thing is we and others have looked at just what nurses are doing. And as we've increased technology, increased documentation requirements for all of the right reasons around quality, also for some payment reasons, you know, the amount of time that nurses are spending on patient care has come down. Um, and, you know, we estimated a few months ago with the ANA um, Center for Innovation that there's a good chunk of time that can actually be given back to nurses to provide care through either delegation to other team members if it's there, as well as automation. And I think health systems are starting to get after some of that. It doesn't relieve, you know, the need for folks, but it at least rebalances some of the workload that we talked about earlier. 
And Gretchen, let me stay with you. We've had a number of questions about uh, the pipeline uh, for, mm -hmm. for nurses in, in, in particular. Um, you know, this is not a, a static situation. Uh, more people could enter the profession, enter uh, programs to train to enter the, the profession. Um, yep. kind of, where do you see that now? And in particular, um, for uh, registered nurses versus um, uh, uh, nurses with um, uh, a bachelor's degree, um, you know, has pay adjusted in order to attract more people into these programs? Yeah, I think um, the, the compensation question is interesting, first of all. So every time we've asked nurses, you know, what attracts you, what keeps you, compensation is on the list, but it's in any of the surveys we've done, it's never been number one. It's always been meaningful work, a positive environment, et cetera. And so, you know, by all means, folks should be paid at the level that they deserve. But it, in my mind, it's not all it's not all about compensation. And also given the competition that we're seeing across players, it's also not a sustainable way to get and keep staff. Um, but to the education and kind of just interest in the field point, I do think a lot of the trauma that our clinicians were exposed to during COVID was an increasing deterrent. I think, frankly, some of the violence that is starting to be portrayed in the news that's playing out in our emergency departments and other care settings is also a, a deterrent. And you know, a little bit to my comment earlier about, you know, what society has done to nursing overall. I personally really believe that. Um, but when you look at just like the education slots versus what we need, you know, our assessment is that we don't have an, have enough um, and that at nursing care broadly, we could be short of about 800,000. And I do think, Larry, your question of, you know, bachelor prepared nurses, other RNs, LPNs, you know, how we think about techs, how we think about advanced practice providers, you know, the, the whole chain um, has opportunity to be looked at and how we collaborate as a team so that everyone is truly doing what they need to at the top of their license. Um, because there isn't, it's not possible for us to, in the current requirements for education, the clinical hours, et cetera, to make enough, call it, baccalaureate prepared nurses to meet the demand. It's a lot harder to say we're going to get enough RNs to meet the demand. But when you start thinking about flexibility in care teams and how people can see patients, including technology, by the way, uh, you know, th there's more degrees of freedom to get there. Um, but I do think we, you know, the education system as currently constructed cannot put out enough new grads to meet with the elevated exits that we're seeing. Larry, could I pick up on uh, Gretchen's point around retention kind of factors that she kind of mentioned there about wages not being a top priority necessarily as like the, the main necessarily driver? Because I think that's actually a common thing across multiple occupations that, you know, there's a there's a feeling of um, goodwill that we've kind of banked on in the healthcare industry where a lot of people find themselves wanting to be in a caring profession. And as a result, they're, they're uh, willing to maybe sacrifice a little bit of uh, wage for the sake of having a job that gives them a lot of fulfillment. Um, and I think to some degree, we've, we've really worn our welcome with the goodwill and that people are saying, you know, this low wages at some point in time is a real factor. I mean, I, kind of to the point earlier, you were asking me about the behavioral health workforce. I mean, we have heard uh, at least anecdotal stories that people are graduating with master's degrees and they're counselors and they can't uh, find a job that pays well and that some of those jobs are paying less than or equal to what bus drivers are making. I mean, that just feels on the face of it, just um, unsustainable for people who are going to school, getting a high level of, um, you know, taking on a uh, higher cost of uh, going for further education. And they have probably loans to pay off and they can't necessarily take on, um, you know, jobs that just don't give them a, a wage that can help them sustain those kind of debts. And Bianca, let me ask you, I mean, you, you mentioned earlier about, um, you know, uh, women being disproportionately represented uh, in, in healthcare, maybe physicians aside, um, <laughs> you know, how much of a role does gender play here? 
I think it plays a big role. I think certainly uh, during the pandemic across the board, we realized the importance of women uh, being a big part of the workforce generally, but particularly in healthcare, where again, if you look at the overall healthcare industry, it's something like 75% of workers in the healthcare industry across all jobs are women. Um, and then you look in the long-term care sector, we're up to 80 to 90% of the people in those jobs being women. And so, and, and, you know, many of them have children. So, but even if you don't have children, and I'm one of them is that you might have older parents that you have to take care of. So, and we have plenty of people in that sandwich generation that they're taking care of both elderly parents and um, children at the same time without any financial support from their employers to make that happen. And then you add to that. So childcare is super certainly exp expensive. We are also try trying to also try to figure out how to care for our parents, you know, either on our own dime or find home health care workers for our own parents. And then you add to that when those services all stopped during the pandemic uh, or were on hold, it became very difficult for people uh, to figure out how to care for everybody around them, let alone themselves. I mean, and that goes back to the mental health part is that people were have been struggling with mental health challenges themselves during this pandemic. And that contribute has been contributing to a rising need for more mental health care. I think it's another example uh, of the diversity of the problem too, because, you know, cost of living in New York City is very different than, you know, a suburban center in you know, I don't, I don't want to pick a state, but, <laughs> um, and so that, but our wages in healthcare aren't as necessarily as diverse as the cost of living. And I think we see health systems therefore compensating with housing, whether it's allowances or literally housing offering, you know, literally providing the child care when the child care doesn't exist in the surrounding uh, environment. So it's certainly not equal across our country. Um, we also had a number of questions about what uh, states are are doing here. And uh, Alice, let me start with you. I mean, on in long term care in particular, uh, Medicaid plays a big role in in financing it. Um, you know, what are some of the things states have done to to um, to alleviate the shortages, alleviate you know the um, disparity uh, across areas? Sure. Well, states are increasing their payment rates for both nursing facility and home-based care, and they have primarily increased their fee-for-service payment rates, but states have told us that the managed care companies tend to follow that pattern. But they're also doing a whole lot of other innovative things, particularly in the home-based setting. And during the pandemic, one of the things they actually increased a lot is paying the family caregivers who are at home taking care of their children, spouses, parents. And historically, Medicaid has not allowed people to be paid to care for their legally responsible relatives. But that is something that CMS has increasingly allowed and states really picked up during the pandemic, recognizing that there weren't caregivers available, right? And so most states use temporary authorities to start doing this. Uh, the real challenge is a lot of those programs ended November 11th. And so people may find that either they can no longer be paid to care for their child, but there's no paid professional to take over, or they may find that they can only be paid for 20 hours of care, even though they're providing 40, 50, 60 hours of care. And so I think what we'll be watching is how does this play out in the year ahead? And, and Bianca, uh, I mean, both you and Gretchen mentioned um, uh, geographic disparities. Uh, we had a question about underserved areas and what could be done to attract, uh, you know, workers, healthcare workers to, to those areas. Uh, do you see anything states have, have done or the federal government has done to try to try to address that? Sure. I mean, a lot of the attention tends to go to rural communities in particular who have a hard time um, keeping particularly high wage workers. And some of that is um, attributed to um, challenges that, that people have in terms of finding uh, partners, actually, to be honest, or keeping a partner um, employed in some of those rural areas, as well as finding the um, schools and the uh, and the other services that they might want to raise their children in rural communities. Not to say that rural communities don't offer wonderful other values, but this is something we're hearing from folks who move to a rural community for a short period of time and then leave is that what they're struggling with is, is kind of challenges around making sure that their family 
is getting all the their needs met too simultaneously. Um, I think among the things that seem to be working um, are so loan repayment programs do help keep people for a short period of time, but we need kind of longer term solutions like recruiting actually from uh, from those communities and investing in those communities um, uh, in in the members of the communities themselves. Because I think what we're certainly finding is that people who are from rural communities go to school in rural communities, they're more likely to maybe stay and live in a rural community, whether it be the one that they grew up in or another one. Um, so that certainly can help a lot. I mean, similarly for underserved communities, and we can certainly do more to diversify our workforce, especially at the higher wage jobs. We have a lot of diversity actually in our low wage uh, jobs in the home health and nursing uh, kind of uh, nursing facility jobs. Uh, but we need to do more to invest in, um, in, in our underserved communities to make sure that people have opportunities to move up the career ladders, become nurses, become physicians, uh, become pharmacists and and have these high wage jobs um, and and part of it again is recruiting from the community themselves and this is good for patients. I mean we need a workforce that looks like the patients that, that's being served so that they can so patients feel like they're being understood. So when it goes to questions around again back to shortages, what we certainly have a shortage of is a shortage of a of a a workforce that represents the patients that are being cared for. And Bianca, let me stay with you. We had a um, number of questions about uh, strikes <laughs> uh, in, in healthcare. Um, you know, we saw a strike at Kaiser Permanente. We've seen strikes among pharmacists, walkouts, uh, not strikes at uh, CVS and, and Walgreens. Um, you know, is this uh, unusual uh, in, in healthcare? What do you think is driving it? And, and kind of looking ahead, do you, do you see this happening more often uh, and why? Yeah, you know, the strike with Kaiser Permanente was particularly interesting because it was everyone but doctors and nurses who really were the ones like going on strike fighting for their rights. When a lot of times we tend to hear more in the news are nurses uh, tending to go on strikes. And I think what it kind of shows is that all of the healthcare system, all kinds of healthcare workers are feeling the stress right now. Um, and so, and, and certainly physicians and nurses kind of walked out kind of in support of these other workers, but it was really with the eye on these other workers that needed, uh, that felt, felt the stress. Um, and so that was a particularly unique thing about that um, strike. And what What's great is to see that it seems like it's been it's been resolved. It's getting written up. And what happened here in Washington State is that Washington State Kaiser Permanente workers striked afterwards, or were planning to strike afterwards, and kind of end up signing on to the deal that had happened with the other uh, states uh, workers who are with Kaiser. And so, um, and what it seems like is that there seemed to be a good agreement around wages and benefits and providing kind of the the things that we are all we've been all talking about kind of about what it takes to retain workers. Um, I think in the pharmacy sector it's a little different. Uh, this is an area that has kind of been ongoing and struggling for some time and and doesn't quite probably get the attention it deserves. Is um, that what's happening in the pharmacy sector? It, there's a lot happening there. I mean, between your pharmacy benefit managers and trying to figure out how to. Uh, uh, kind of navigate what is happening with um, acquisitions of pharmacies, especially your community pharmacies by your larger retail uh, pharmacy chains. Um, we, we need a better grasp of what's happening there. But generally, the feeling is twofold. One is that pharmacy technicians are really hard to retain. Again, this is another job that doesn't take a lot of um, education to get into. And so these workers, we're, we're, they're being uh, sought after or they're finding jobs in other sectors. So that's one piece of it. Um, and then you add to that pharmacists are feeling a lot of pressure to do a lot of dispensing. And they're looking at themselves thinking, you know, I have a five-year doctorate. Why am I only dispensing? I'm trained to do so much more. More, but they are really not paid to do that kind of work. And so again, they're feeling this burden of just doing a lot of volume of prescriptions without feeling the value again of, of their work. And I think we need to have a better discussion about whether or not we're really leveraging the scope of practice of pharmacists um, and really um, using them to the top of their scope. Um, and, and actually that is really driven by payment and that fact that we're really not paying them to do that kind of work. We just don't have a model that does that. And, and very different in, in the US than in other countries. Um, uh, you know, pharmacists are in many ways the front lines of healthcare in, in many other countries. Um, and they certainly could be here. <laughs> yeah. I, I, Gretchen, I, so uh, Bianca mentioned payment. We've had a whole bunch of questions about uh, insurance payment, how that relates to it. 
um, kind of in, insurance in general. I mean, prior authorization, paperwork that uh, yeah. uh, clinicians uh, have to do in, increasingly, electronic medical records. Um, you know, how do you think about that? How how does that affect quality of 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 work life uh, for for nurses in in particular? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a it's an interesting question. I. <laughs> We haven't teased out, you know, how much of the workload, you know, exactly can you tie back. However, what I can tell you is the the workload is always number one or number two in terms of what's driving people's decisions to stay or leave. And then when we have dug into what is in the workload, um, only about 54% of that is actually direct patient care. There's some other things in there like breaks and learning, which I think we would all say, you know, teaching are good. They estimate that about 15% of their time today is spent on charting. What was really interesting is we asked, what's your ideal time? And it only decreased a little bit, which I think is twofold. One, you know, people wish they weren't spending as much time doing it, but if they have to do it, I think they wish they got more time to do it. And we don't spend a bunch of time talking about pajama time for nurses the way that we do for um, physicians and other advanced uh, practitioners. But um, I think there is an element of that in there. And when you actually, you know, look at what a nurse is doing in documentation, obviously some of it is very important for handoffs and for the care, the care plan and, and for the care team. But a big part of it is, you know, checking boxes to make sure you're hitting what you need to for payer requirements, for um, prior authorizations, for appropriate, you know, coding and therefore reimbursement. And, you know, the cost of care is in large part driven by the cost of labor. You know, on the health system side, about half of the cost is workforce. And, you know, it, it varies, but about half of that is nurses. So uh, it is a huge investment when you add it up that we are putting in to then be paid on the back end. One of my favorite things to try and find right now is opportunities where providers are wasting time on things like that and health plans are wasting administrative effort on it. And it's, you know, there's all these double costs that we have in our healthcare system um, as we've created such a complex piece of it. Um, so, you know, I can't give you an exact answer of, you know, if we could get rid of prior auths, we would retain X number of nurses, but the connection points are, are certainly there. And Gretchen, you, you mentioned earlier some, uh, some innovations um, in delivery that, um, yeah. you know, could, could help, uh, you know, both with quality of work life, but also, um, you know, the need for, uh, for, for staffing. Um, you know, talk a little bit about that and, and you know, what, yeah. what's potential for AI or other, other yeah. new technologies here? I think, you know, everyone's very excited about AI and everyone likes to talk about the, the really clinical applications of it, but I'm actually most excited about the non-clinical, like less sexy applications of it. So, in, and forget about even the gen AI. In healthcare, we have so much opportunity to leverage just the data we have for analytics. So on the staffing front, I think one of the most promising things is actually projecting demand for patients which there is, of course, unforeseeable events in healthcare. You're always going to have folks walking into emergency rooms with heart attacks. You're going to have car accidents, et cetera. But the vast majority of it is relatively predictable. And even those events are pretty consistent over time. And so how do you leverage that data and the technology that we have to project, therefore, where do you need staff and what kind of staff? Because anytime we look in a health system, you have units that are short what they would need entering the shift. And so you have this frenzy of, you know, calling people on, doing overtime, et cetera, which no one really likes. And then you have other areas that are a bit overstaffed, or maybe that's the way it looks throughout the day. And so I think there's an opportunity to really optimize, even with the resources we have, recognizing there aren't enough resources. So I think that's the first thing. The, the second thing is just leveraging technology to help. And it's hard because every time a system adds a technology, it's another yet another interface for staff to work with. And so figuring out how to integrate all of them either automatically into the EMR or automatically into the you know, communication system, I think is key so that we're not adding on top. 
But there are technologies out there now with, you know, Bluetooth on various devices that nurses may be looking for. You know, nurses told us that they spend over 5% of time in a hunting and gathering category. But you think about that over the course of a year for the number of nurses we're talking about, it's a massive amount of time versus how we have it in other parts of our life where you can find your keys on your phone in 10 seconds. You know, why do we have nurses running around looking in closets for things? So there's technologies like that that can just help and free up time. And again, that doesn't mean that we can use fewer nurses necessarily, but perhaps that nurse actually has more time to go to the bathroom or eat a sandwich or, you know, coach a peer or be coached so that they're part of that valuable uh, workforce that they want. There's a lot of talk on virtual nursing, you know, supporting, there's a lot of, uh, you know, automation and, and technology supporting med administration, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I actually think some of the simplest kind of analytics up front that frees up nurse managers and nurses time from dealing with the chaos that is still staffing and scheduling is is most promising. And, and uh, Bianca, you, you mentioned earlier um, issues of scope of practice. Um, if you could talk a little bit more uh, about that. Um, and, you know, I mean, there there um, one could imagine that playing out in multiple ways. I mean, you know, asking nurses or expecting nurses or allowing nurses to do more uh, relative to physicians could increase the demand for, for nurses. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, making greater use of pharmacists, as you said, or uh, community health workers uh, or family caregivers that, that Alice talked about um, could kind of expand uh, the, the potential workforce here. Yeah, thank you for that question. You know, one thing that um, kind of your question earlier about some state innovations that are happening to help with some shortage issues. During this pandemic, we've actually saw a lot of state innovation around scope of practice. Um, there were a lot of uh, changes, uh, regulations that were um, kind of experimented with over the course of the pandemic to expand scope of practice as a way to get people quickly into the workforce or getting the capacity that we needed to care for all the people um, that were needed. But some of these scope of practice things were fairly simple, and it goes back to some technology issues around like telehealth whether or not you needed to have prior authorization from some other provider uh, in order to you know, be able to see a patient or having to see a patient in person before you ever see them online. And some of those things just, uh, we, we waived those requirements for at least a couple of years uh, until the public health emergency ended, in which case now they're all being rolled back and we need to, and, but they're all being rolled back without doing any proper study about whether some of these things actually worked out pretty well. Um, you know, some of these things, when we talk about scope of practice, where the conversation tends to go is about the um, fighting over a turf, uh, like territorial battles over the activities that say a nurse practitioner can do versus a physician. And then we have a conversation about like, who does it better, rather than having a conversation about like, well, what was what's the need that patients actually have and who is there to provide that care? Um, and and what else should people be doing perhaps instead? So for those physicians who feel like they're overlapping with nurse practitioners, well, you know, there's plenty of demand to go around. So those nurse practitioners can certainly take it on. Maybe we should be having a conversation with the physicians and say, well, what other activities should you be doing with your uh, with all that training that you have, because you certain their physicians certainly feel that they have the capacity to do something better than nurses because they've had so many years of training. But I think we're not having that conversation to say, but what are those things that we're not leveraging your education to do that we could be incentivizing you to do bet more of? And this happens across many jobs. I don't mean to just focus on nurses versus physicians. This kind of discussion happens between dental hygienists and dentists. It happens between pharmacy technicians and pharmacists. Um, and I think the, the key question is really try to figure out how to leverage all workers to take advantage of all the education that they have. But one problem that we have is that not everyone understands how each other were trained and what they're actually trained to do. And there isn't, um, while people work side by side, it's, uh, I think there's a lot of respect that does actually happen on the floors of, of these clinics, of these hospitals where people respect each other, but there isn't enough opportunity to have a dialogue to say, but what were you really trained to do? What can we do to make sure that you as a worker here um, feel like you're contributing and taking advantage of all the education that you have? And, and Alice, let me ask you, in, in, uh, in, in long-term care, nursing facilities in particular, how, how does this play out? 
Well, right now, the biggest shortages we're seeing in nursing facilities are for nurse aides, which are actually the least skilled workers. And to, to me, that reflects more this crisis we're seeing with the direct care workforce. And these are people that don't have formal training. You know, turning back to the pipeline issue, there really is no pipeline for direct care workers the way there are for nurses. And there's growing recognition at the federal level that maybe that's a gap in policy where we might wanna start going into you know, undergraduate programs and saying, this is a career, this isn't just a job. But um, the, some of the most acute shortages are for the least skilled workers. And so then what happens is family caregivers end up being asked to do something like change a catheter, which most parents don't feel equipped to do. And so we end up with a situation where people with you know, very little training are taking on pretty skilled activities. Um, so we are unfortunately coming to the to the end of our time, uh, but I want to give each of you an opportunity to, um, or ask each of you to uh, uh, say one thing you're hopeful about uh, looking ahead, uh, and one thing that that keeps you up at night. Uh, Gretchen, maybe I'll start with you. Sure. Um, I think the thing I'm hopeful about is the focus on uh, the collaboration between health systems and educators. <clears throat> Sometimes that line is even blurring now as we try and solve the inflow. And I think the thing that keeps me up at night is the global challenge of this that I mentioned earlier. And Alice? I'm hopeful that there is, you know, really a bipartisan consensus that, you know, something is needed in the LTSS space and states are actively experimenting, which gives us a chance to learn what works. I think the thing that keeps me up is I'm putting on my former Congressional Budget Office hat and the question of how are we going to pay for this? And Bianca? I think uh, what keep, what I'm hopeful for and what keeps me up at night may be the same thing. So <laughs> on the one hand, I, I am uh, excited that health workforce seems to be a topic of conversation across many different groups of people, whether it be those on the Hill, employers, uh, just even the public reading the news almost every day I see some story about the health workforce and I'm really glad that that people are talking about it um, that maybe healthcare workers voices are being heard um, but at the same time I'm it worries me I, I think we may be missing a policy window kingdom's policy window you know this is the opportunity right now and we may be passing it by and not see as much movement as maybe we should. I think we need to listen to the workers themselves. I think those strikes are certainly a, a sign that workers are not going to take it anymore. This is their moment to to have their voices heard. Not every worker is, there's certainly um, occupations that are not very big and they're not well represented out there. Nurses are one of those biggest occupations out there. And so, and they're well organized sometimes by unions. And so their voices are being heard loudly, um, but they're really a canary in the coal mine for all the other healthcare workers um, who might be working alongside them and just don't have that same voice and power. And I think now is that time that hopefully we are listening and paying attention to kind of what's happening on the ground. Because if we don't, you know, we're just going to repeat the same mistakes later on. <laughs> Well, I, I, I do think of health policy as, as Groundhog Day. We kind of wake up uh, true. year after year, decade after <laughs> decade, and, and deal with the same issues. Uh, but I agree with you, Bianca. It feels a little bit different now in that there's a, a greater uh, policy focus, and as Alice, Alice said, you know, some bipartisan attention uh, to, to some of these issues. Um, well, Bianca, Gretchen, Alice, thanks for a, a great discussion. Uh, thanks for the audience uh, for listening and, and participating. Uh, and join us next time for the Health Walk Shop. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Take care.